We are running through the letters that Peter wrote to the church that was scattered. Today we have come to chapter 2. I'm going to take the whole chapter 2 today. It's quite a long passage. And the title is Counterfeit Christianity. <coughs> and we all have experienced one time or the other how somehow we were ripped or we thought it was a genuine merchandise and after some times we discovered it wasn't. We were deceived and it was not the original, it was the counterfeit and then we regret it. And uh, sometimes we could even exchange the existence of the counterfeit gives us the sense of how important it is to have something genuine. The experience with the counterfeit makes us to long for something that is genuine. And looking at the Bible, looking at the church, looking at the very nature of God, Why is it that so many people don't like to come to church? Why is it that so many people just simply don't want to hear about Jesus Christ? Now, it's, it's very rare for someone to say, I don't want to come to church because I don't believe in Jesus. It's very rare for people to say, I don't, I don't accept Jesus to be the God. And especially in the Western culture, in the Christian societies or post-Christian societies, when people say they don't want to come to church, rarely will they say that I don't want to come to church because Jesus is not God or something. They will always say, I hate church, I hate Christians, Christians are liars and hypocrites. In the essence of Christianity where Jesus summarizes the whole thing and says, Love God, love your fellow human being, so much so that you've got to love your enemies as well. Now if that is the standard, that is the essence of Christianity, then if you're supposed to love your enemies, if you're supposed to love all those that are there, how much more you and I ought to be loving among each other. And when there is a loving community, when there is a caring community, when there is a sincere community, definitely when someone comes in, they would like to be a part of it. So most of these resistance against the gospel comes because we have somehow been victim of the counterfeit Christianity. And the antidote against this counterfeit Christianity as I have been saying from the last two Sundays from Second Peter is the focus on the Word of God. It's going back to the basics so to say to the foundation in which Peter said God has given us everything for life and godliness and after explaining that this life and godliness is based upon the promises of God in His great promises, by His great promises, precious promises, He has given us everything for life and godliness. Life for us to live and godliness to demonstrate this Christian life to those who are in the world. And then He told in chapter 1, then you've got to add something. You need to beautify your Christian life, my Christian life. We need to somehow go to the cosmetic store. And, uh, you know, instead of wasting thousands of dollars and changing my nose, I need to change my heart. I need to change my mind. I need to change my tongue. <coughs> and then, naturally, my behaviors, my actions will take care of themselves. I need to spend money and time and effort in beautifying my heart. I need to take times and make effort to beautifying in my way of thinking and then how I speak. If I can take care of these inequalities in my life, then my <laughs> external, outward expression of my Christian faith will become beautiful. It will become attractive. 
I was listening to a very prominent Pakistani Muslim scholar who made, who's living in the U.S. now. And you see Islam making so many headlines and terrorists and all. But this man is a very faithful, devout Muslim. But the way he emphasizes for the Muslims to beautify their faith, I wrote to him and said, Brother, you make Islam very attractive. It's kind of, a, if you have never heard him, or if you always in the news only, terrorists and attacks and all, we all can assume Islam to be something very repulsive. But within such a context, if when people begin to beautify their inequalities, <coughs> their faith also becomes attractive. But we as Christians, we have everything beautiful. <coughs> Nothing is repulsive about Jesus Christ. There are so many other religious founders, founder of religious societies, there are many things you could, could find that you don't like, something very repulsive, even though they justify it and interpret it. But when you come to Jesus, there is nothing repulsive. There's nothing that you can accuse him of. Not only you, the worst enemy of Christ also couldn't find anything to accuse him. The guy who sentenced him to be killed said, I find no fault. Nothing repulsive in Christ. Then why is Christianity becoming so repulsive? It's because we have not allowed that beautiful part of Christ to, to beautify our inner qualities. And therefore today, Peter is asking us to go back to the basics, to fall in the words of Christ, to teachings of Christ. And then, at the same time, beware of the false Christianity. Beware of the, the kind of counterfeit Christianity that is there. In chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, last we saw, let me read first. In chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, he said, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of the things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter was emphasizing in chapter 1 the importance of the Word of God in the light of counterfeit preachers and teachers and Christians. He said, this word you need to fall back on. This is the word. Though humans spoke, though humans wrote it, but they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, whatever they have said, it has come from the mind of God. Therefore, you can depend upon this word. You can trust this word. And this word, if you give hope a uh, chance, it will give you hope. If you take this word very seriously, it will redeem you from the corruption that is in the world. <clears throat> this word will be the only solution for you to live a holy and a perfect life if you're longing to live in this world. Without it, you cannot escape the corruption that is in the world. And then you see in chapter 3, let's see, before we go to chapter 2. In chapter 3, he says like this in verse 1 and 2, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to a wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. In chapter 1 also he has said, the word of God, the prophets and the apostles' word is given by the Holy Spirit. And chapter 3 also he says, the words of the prophet and the words of the apostles are the word of God. And then in between, let us read now the whole passage. If you have patience with me, please bear with me as I read the whole chapter. Listen 
very carefully how dramatic and how harsh Peter is. After saying the word of God is from the Holy Spirit and say pay attention to this word like a lamp signing in a dark place. Now he said but verse 1 chapter 2 but there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In this in their greed these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he didn't spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by bringing them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such things when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be cut and destroyed like animals they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you with eyes full of adultery. They never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are expert in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered up to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the ways of wickedness. For he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water, mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for their mouth empty boastful words and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I are again entangled in it and are overcome they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to his vomit and a soul that is washed returns to her wallowing in mud. This is a harsh indictment of a counterfeit Christian community and their leaders. <coughs> A counterfeit Christianity or false teacher is not on the basis of the content of what they teach. In, in, in many cases, yes, it will eventually come. But the counterfeit Christian community or a false teacher is leveled as a false teacher here, not on the basis of one's content of teaching, but the character and its motivation. One is leveled as a false or a true disciple of Christ based upon the character and the motivation. So when you say false teacher or a counterfeit Christians, they may have a right doctrine. They may be teaching the right thing, but with the wrong motivation. Their teachings are not followed by their characters. So that's one. 
you have to understand that false teachers does not mean that their teaching is necessarily false, though it is going to be at the end, but starting time they may be teaching the right thing, but with the wrong motive, and their characters don't match with what they preach. And that is a counterfeit Christianity. In this, I would like to just run through this passage. First of all, the presence of the false teachers will be always there. Like he said here, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Talking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there were many false prophets. Now, in the olden days, people did not have the word of God written to them. The revelation of God was coming <coughs> progressively and God would send prophets to tell the people, the nation and the king, or the leader, and they would speak from God and tell these people what to do, how to do, where to go. So the prophets played a very prominent role in the Old Testament. But oftentimes these prophets became false, not necessarily they were not believing in God or something, what they did was, in order to benefit materially from the king, they would then prophesy only what the king would like to listen or hear. For example, Micah or Micah is a prophet during King Jehoshaphat and Ahab. There are so many prophets in Israel, they only spoke what the king wanted in northern kingdom. But there was one prophet that Ahab hated. And the good king Jehoshaphat, the, the Israel was divided between north and south, and the southern king, the king Jehoshaphat, visits north for a political alliance and the marriage. At that time, the northern king said, why don't we go together and fight against their, uh, the, their enemy? And then Jehoshaphat said, okay, but I want to hear from the prophet. Then he said, yeah, there are many prophets. Then he brings all these kind of uh, hidden prophets. And he said, no, no, I want to hear from a prophet who believes in Je Yahweh. I said, yeah, there is one, but he never prophesies anything good. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat, no, nevertheless, I want to hear from him. And Micah tells that these people will be totally defeated. And later, of course, Ahab comes to an end. So the false prophets were those prophets who only prophesied for benefit. Jeremiah was one example who had to confront these false prophets. Jeremiah said, God said through Jeremiah, submit to Babylon. Babylon is a powerful nation. It's coming. I'm going to bring them. But if you submit to them, I will save you. I will deliver you. But there were many other prophets who said, no, we should not submit to Babylon. Babylon cannot destroy you. We have a temple of God in Jerusalem. Nobody can remove this temple. Rather, we will trust in Egypt. And Jeremiah said, no, don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in Egypt. Trust in God and allow the Babylonian come. And when they come, God will deliver you. They did not listen to him. They put him in prison. They wanted to kill him. So there were many, many such false prophets in the Old Testament. And Peter said, just like they were false prophets, there will always be false teachers in the church. Because the human greed and a human desire to live in the lust of the flesh cannot disappear. And church becomes a much more fertile ground for such teachers to come and take advantage of the people. It is very difficult to go and work hard and earn money, but it's so easy to walk into a congregation or start a ministry or, or do something with the deceptive motivations and fool the people. That's what he said. The false teachers will be always there because in the Old Testament, Word of God came directly, but in the New Testament, we have the Word of God written and recorded. And all that we need is to read this Word and interpret it and put it into practice. But these prophets will come in the name of teaching the Word of God to you, and then they will twist the Word. 
they will use this word as a cover for their own <coughs> intended purpose. So the false prophet will be always there. Their presence will be always in our communities and it will need for us to detect them and to stand upon the word of God. We will have to be the knowledgeable people in order to stand up against these counterfeit Christians. If you don't know the Bible, if you have never read the word of God, if you don't have a clear conviction of, on certain things in life, these false prophets can come so easily and deceive you. How? Their methods are very deceptive. Secretive. Their presence, they will be always there. And a false prophet does not have to be a heretic who denies directly, but they will come secretive. And secretly, the methods here in verse 1, second part and 2 and 3, he said, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought, bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Christianity becomes repulsive here again. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Uh, South Asia is still very much illiterate. People may have gone to high schools and gotten their university degrees, but the way of thinking is still not so uh, refined uh, that we see in West, uh, uh, sometimes even the, the East now. The Western rationalism and the Eastern Confucianism hasn't come to South Asia. And one of our challenges in the church today <coughs> is to retain members in the church if I focus on the exposition of the Bible. The members don't like it. And if down the road there is another pastor who is telling them about the visions and the dream he has, about this amazing experience he had and the, his ability to heal some sick people, all my members will go there. Because they, here, they deceive you or exploit you with their fabricated stories. We like to hear personal stories so much. Don't we? We want to, if I say, you know, I had an amazing experience last night and God told me this and I'm going to tell you that and you got to do this and you got to do that, you like it. I tell you how <coughs> educated, how talented you may be. If you're longing for something supernatural and I come and give you, you will buy it. Last July 29, there is a woman I will not name a very prominent international preacher in Florida. She moved to some other place now. July 29, she sent a newsletter to the all members that she is pastoring at church, a big church. She said, God has spoken to me through some verses, chapter 29, verse 29. Okay, you know, some verse there, there are some. God has spoken to me through the verse, chapter 29, verse 29. And that he said, if you send $290 by the end of July 29, 2014, all your debts are going to be cancelled. And God is going to do an amazing financial breakthrough in your life. You're going to receive the miracle. And if you cannot send $290, at least send $29. This is a woman who is a world famous. And people buy that. They like those things. And many, many hundreds, if not thousands, must have sent money to her. That is how the counterfeit Christianity 
is becoming repulsive in the eyes of the watching world. And we as genuine believers also fall easily victim to them because they bring these fabricated deceptive stories and personal experiences instead of focusing on the written and the revealed word of God. They bring their personal testimonies, personal experiences, dreams and visions. And there is one particular preacher in South Asia Every time he speaks in any different places that he goes, he said, my mother died when she was young. And then after some years, I had a vision that my mother is in hell and my mother is telling me from hell. Every time I see her, she tells me to go and preach the gospel. So I have come here to tell you the gospel. And we will like it. What Jesus has written, what the words of Christ command us to do is not so attractive. But if I say, oh, my mother died when I was a young child, but now I am a middle-aged man. And suddenly I had a vision of my mother in hell. And she told me, my son, don't come here. Go and preach the gospel to those who are. And that's why I'm preaching here. And he becomes very popular. A counterfeit Christianity is driven by greed. And greed calls deception. They have to deceive us. Secretly, they even deny. If they don't deny Christ, they cannot be deceiving each other. They pretend to be godly. Paul says, they have the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. The power of the cross of Christ, the power of forgiveness of our sins is not necessarily, they don't even bother about it, but what they do <coughs> is their personal amazing stories to attract the believers so that they can come there and pay the money that they need. The motivation for health, wealth and prosperity is very attractive. If you say, if you come to church, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be happy, you're going to be rich, you're going to be famous, you're going to be powerful. What is it? They are appealing to our flesh. They are appealing to the lust of the flesh that likes to enjoy this present life. They tickle where these are attracted. They, they entice us. They exploit with those kind of... So health, wealth, gospel sometimes can become a very destructive in destroying the Christian conviction, Christian faith. When you focus on health, wealth and the pride, you are generally you're elevating the lust of the flesh. You are focusing here and now and you become a man-centered Christian. Man is the most important and man's message becomes most important and uh, man's organization becomes most important and because this man is telling you that if you come to this church if you come to this group if you do this and if you do that you also might enjoy health wealth and prosperity uh, it's a flesh elevating message not spirit elevating so they are very rampant. They are everywhere in the church. They are in the west, they are in the east, they are in the center, they are in the north, they are in the south. They are in Pentecostal churches, they are in Presbyterian churches, Baptist, Brethren, all kind of churches you will see such people. There will be always this desire to fulfill the lust of the flesh and church becomes an easy ground for a clever-minded man or a woman to deceive the innocent people by wonderful, amazing stories. And after some time, <coughs> that group, that person, that church becomes a blame, blame is a spot, uh, a disgrace in the body of Christ. And people look at, and they only see those kind of things. Therefore, Peter says, what is their end? Their end is destruction. No matter how much these people want to be rich and famous, they will never ever be able to avert the coming punishment. Jesus is a gentle lamp of God. But in the book of Revelation, he is not a gentle lamp, he is a fearful lamp. 
he is a mighty lion who will sit upon the throne. And therefore, this false Christianity or counterfeit Christianity will have its end, and that is destruction. He said, their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Just because it is not happening in our time doesn't mean it's not happening. It is happening. Not only counterfeit Christians, but any non-Christians attacking the Christians also will see their destruction come and take place. In Acts chapter 12, we see how James was killed and Peter was placed in the prison so that he could be killed the following day. Herod Agrippa I was really wanting to consolidate his power and he wanted to please the Jews by wiping out the Christians and he began to arrest these leaders and succeeding by killing James, he was more motivated to do so. So he arrests Peter, puts him in prison. But somehow, in divine grace, Peter is released. And next day, he disappears. And Herod finds out he was so mad that he went and killed all those guards. And he became so disturbed that he moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And there, maybe out of his this kind of disgrace that there's such a uh, failure in security, you know, such a the Bin Laden escaped, for example, from Guantanamo Bay. What would have happened to Obama? So the Herod goes to Caesarea, and he wants to enjoy, and then maybe at the same time happens to be uh, Emperor's Memorial Day or birthday or something. He had this amazing festivity going on. And uh, when the Josephus said he wore a silver suit and in the bright shining he was like an angel. Luke says he wore a royal robe and people began to praise him and say you are a divine being. You are mighty. You are powerful. You are a God. They literally say, so far we respected you as a man, but now you are divine. And at that moment, Luke says, the angel of the Lord struck him and he was eaten by worms. And Joseph said he was so stricken at that time and he was taken to the palace, but in five days he died. Definitely something struck him. So, just because we can play fool for a while does not mean there is no price for it. Counterfeit Christianity. Also, the false teachers will have a much more severe punishment. How do we know? Then he gives the historical example of their predecessors. Those false prophets, those false community, those people who chose the lust of the flesh instead of the trust in God, received their just punishment. How? Look at in verse 4. Angels paid for it. He says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to hell for judgment. It talks about maybe some heavenly rebellion. There's a self-centered pride as we see from Isaiah and Ezekiel talks about heavenly rebellion. He said, God did not spare these angels, even though there are good angels still. Then he said, God did not spare the ends in the world. He said, in verse 5, he said, if he did not spare the ends in the world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. The whole world paid for their wickedness. But God rescued, just like he rescued some good angels, he rescued Noah and his family. Then he said, not only the angels, not only the whole world, but comes to cities, particular cities or a nation. In verse 6 onward, he said, If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lord a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. 
counterfeit Christianity will not bring the intended desire for prosperity and peace and happiness and all. Counterfeit Christianity will bring the judgment of God either in this life and if you're lucky enough to escape in this life, you will have to face this divine wrath of God. Lately, uh, there's so much uh, news coming out of Nepal about Christian pastors. Somehow, Nepal's journalism has decided to turn on the Christians now. They are motivated by Hindu fundamentalism. <coughs> so, even though Nepal is uh, more than 86% or so Christ uh, Hindus, they declared it a secular nation a few years ago and the Hindus are so mad and they think the Christians are behind it and all. God is amazingly working through the communists but the blame goes to the Christians. And these journalists are digging out the personal lives of various pastors and they found out so many of them have been corrupt. Now, they have built big, big, huge buildings and mansions. And Nepal was just coming out of persecution in the 80s and 90s was the beginning. And so many Westerns and Eastern mission organizations came in and supported these pastors. But there was a deep-rooted corruption in the missions and, and the church ministries. And these journalists are now bringing out this and the pastors are having heart attacks. <laughs> they have to be disgraced if government really comes after them they will have to go to prison but at one time they were so enjoying in the this counterfeit Christianity in the false teaching, in the greed and they would exaggerate their ministry, if they have a 10 church they will say I have 100 churches, if they have 10 members they will say 100 members and so many ways they will deceive the foreign donors foreign church or the church in the west and the east. But now, when their names are tarnished and the, and the government is coming after them, they don't know where to go. It's very painful when the judgment begins to come. So that's what he's saying. God did not spare the angels. He didn't spare the whole world. He didn't even spare those cities. But in this process of God's punishment, he was not forgetting the righteous one. If it is one family, one man out of the whole world, he took care of it. If it is one man and his daughters in all these destructive cities, he took care of them. And he said, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly and punish the ungodly. It's so easy to fall victim to them, but it, we need to stand up on our faith. We need to read the Word of God. We need to check whether my motivations, my characters match with the Word of God. Peter is not talking here. He is not telling that if you are unable to live a morally perfect life, you're a false teacher. No. What he's telling is that if you are using your Christianity as a cover to get something other than your Christian salvation, <coughs> then naturally you're not going to live a moral life. Because your ultimate purpose or this false teacher's ultimate purpose or a false pastor's ultimate purpose is not to minister to the people, not to give God the glory, somehow get money. So that once he gets the money, then he can fulfill the lust of his flesh. So that makes a man false. I may be teaching a very good message, but if my motivation is to deceive you, so that you would be attracted to my need and give to me what I need, then I'm going to give and satisfy, uh, go and fulfill my lust. That's, that makes me a false teacher. But Peter says, destruction is reserved. It's not sleeping. What is their nature? Look at uh, quickly the nature of these uh, false teachers. He says they, especially this is true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and depravity. What? How do they? 
they they are full of pride and mockery these false teachers are full of pride and mockery i saw the danger of false christianity i saw the danger of corruption in mission way back when we were began we were beginning in the ministry and it was somewhere in the year 2000 or 2001 or 2 somewhere i had written an article outlining the danger that we will face in the future if christian churches and missions are not taking care of the corruption that is going on and all my pastors friend who were successful who were enjoying who were riding the tide of the prosperity gospel mocked at me everywhere and my wife comes from a northeastern state of india which is the name is manipur and there are many places manipur as is okay, sampur and pur is a kind of a cities or places suffix i remember one time visiting a very successful person where is your wife from uh, my wife is from manipur oh that's why you are very poor pastor and then they would meet me oh you are you are so rebellious you are so arrogant you are writing against many pastors because you are jealous because you can't have what they have mocking was one way they were sidelining me but today they are hiding one pastor does not know how to dispose the property so he is giving some one house to one family member another house another family member another land another family member so that when the government comes after him he will have somehow something to justify with false teachers of arrogant and rebellious and bent on pleasing the lust of the flesh <coughs> let me read bold and arrogant they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings yet even angels although they are st- stronger and more powerful do not heap the abuse on such things when bringing judgment on them from the lord but these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand they are like unreasoning animals creatures of instinct born only to be cut and destroyed and like animals they too will perish they do not have a rational understanding of what is happening they they want to go to heaven they want to believe in jesus christ but at the same time they practice this kind of deceptive corrupt lustful lifestyle and many of time you saw he was so famous one day but the next day he was fallen they mock god by their behaviors they even mock god by their words they they make god so small and some people have gone to say even paul and apostles didn't, they didn't know as much as these false teachers know they are irrational in mocking god sometimes not only the false teachers if you see hollywood today every comedy that you watch or listen to the richest material they get for the comedy is when they mock god or the things of god but we as counterfeit christian sometimes we may not mock god with our words but we mock god with our actions these counterfeit christian teachers and christians they mock god is a mockery in the face of god's goodness and mercy so they are full of greed and lust look at it they will be paid back with harm and harm and their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight they are blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasure what they feast with you with eyes full of adultery they never stop sinning they seduce the unstable they are expert in greed and a curse now it looks very strange my brothers and sisters maybe you have not met such people i have met I have met a man who was a big mission director in India but he was a very perverted person. Yet no one could speak because he had a lot of money. <coughs> I have heard and I have known many such Christians who ran organizations, orphanages and were exploiting the children and the weak. And yet coming to the pulpit and preaching perfectly that's a counterfeit christianity 
that is a disgrace in the face of the earth. They are harmful and violent. They will attack you. If you attack them, they will not be afraid to do harm to you. But they are full of lust and full of greed. They are like Balaam. You know, the story of Balaam in the Old Testament is that he was enticed to curse the people of God for the money. He even said one time to the king who wanted him to curse the people of Israel, said, even if you give half of your kingdom, I cannot go and do what the Lord tells me not to do. But somehow, because the money was big, he does go to curse. On the way, his donkey refused to go. And he began to beat the donkey. And finally, donkey spoke. And the funny thing is that Balaam was surprised and said, Are you making fool of me? That's what he God used a donkey to stop the madness of a prophet. Balaam said to the donkey, Are you making fool of me? God will use the donkeys. God will use whatever it takes in his own time to stop. But the sad thing is, my brothers and sisters, we too can be easily deceived by these false counterfeit Christians. And our Christian life can become very miserable sometimes. When you focus at what they are doing, how they are saying, how they are living, then a genuine pastor, a genuine preacher or a believer can become very discouraged. Okay, maybe I'm not so spiritual. They say, if you have faith, if you give money, you will be rich, you will be successful, you will be healthy. Maybe I'm not giving enough money. Maybe I'm not reading the Bible enough. Maybe I'm not praying enough. You fall victim to such kind of Christianity very easily if you don't know the promises of God. And they are, here said, they are marked with emptiness and insatiable desire. In verse 17, these people are spring without water and mist driven by storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. They are spring without water. Now, can there be a spring with, without water? It's, it's an irony here. But the closest uh, would be a dried spring or, or a cistern that had water but now it's dry or a well that had water at one time it's dried now it's nothing there cannot be said in other words how much these false counterfeit Christian preachers try to satisfy it is never enough Robert Suler I liked him a lot in the beginning he helped me definitely uh, to overcome some of my psychological handicap in my early days but in a few years ago, he just collapsed and finally he had to file a lawsuit against the church to get some money. And he got $500,000. It is never enough. How much they have? They are like empty cisterns without water. They are mist, driven by a storm. They will be gone. <coughs> They may be so amazing today, but tomorrow they will be no more. That is why Peter is asking us to focus on the Word of God, to focus on what has been revealed and written, instead of following after these counterfeit Christians. And if you could take the Word of God very seriously and fall upon His promises, you will become a genuine Christian. You will attract others to Christ instead of repulsive. And they, are, they make a lot of promises. Here it says, For their mouth, empty boastful words and appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. The prom they promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For the people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. They make huge promises. Just like I, I cited a woman who said, by July 29, if you send $290, everything is going to be all right. Empty promises. <coughs> Her own marriage fell apart. Her own life is messed up. But they keep on promising and people keep on buying. Because why? 
they entice the people who are just about to escape the error. They are these false promises. They appeal to this need-based humanity. And finally he says, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ, it may be at one time they had a good beginning, but now their end is terrible. He said they are like a pig going, we wash the pig and then he goes back and then dirties. It's like a dog vomits and goes and takes it back again. That is the nature of a counterfeit false Christianity. And these people, maybe at one time they were shaved. Maybe at one time they knew Jesus Christ. Maybe they had escaped the corruption of the world. But they allowed the lust of the flesh to continue. They continue to deceive people. And finally, now their destruction is dreadful. With that, Peter is asking us to focus on the Word of God. How would you become a genuine Christian? How would you make church attractive to the non-Christians? How would you satisfy the desires of Christ in your life? Not by following after certain man or certain kind of messes, but by looking at the promises of God. Trusting the promises of God. This word is intent and is indispensable. Without it, you cannot, I cannot even know what is right and wrong, what is genuine and what is counterfeit. And without it, I can't escape the lust that I myself have. Without it, I can't remove myself away from the corruption of the world. Uh, I cannot uh, stress more the value of reading the Bible. But reading for the sake of reading, though it is good, it's not going to help you. You really need to eat this word. You really need to take this word very seriously and stand upon it. Take him very seriously. Take the word of God very seriously. So with that, shall we close? Uh,